Let's all pray. Father God, I ask this morning that your spirit continues to stay in this house. We know it's already here. We're not asking it to come because it's here. We pray that it stays with us and that my words are your words, Father, and that it enters into our hearts and that it shifts and changes the way we look at life. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. amen. So we're continuing on with uh, acts of worship. This is session 2.0. We're putting the point .0s there because there's videos throughout the week. Uh, that you're going to want to catch. It's not that you'll be lost in, in, in the message by any means at all. Um, it's just that it will help bring maybe a little bit deeper light and understanding to what, what's going on. You know, I, I made this statement in one of the videos, is that we call it the living Word of God for a reason. Because every time you look at it, if you're continuing to seek Spirit, the Spirit will re reveal something more and deeper to you. I've read Scripture after Scripture. I I've, I've, was literally raised in this church literally sleeping here almost equally probably to church to my own home and i heard these scriptures all the time but yet here i am you know, almost 30 years later and i can read the same scripture and it can mean something different that's why we call it the living word of god so we're going to look at this and i'm going to synopsize several chapters of the bible today and it is your job and responsibility and privilege to go read them on your own time because otherwise we'd be here for three hours and our chairs are not recliners to get you comfortable enough to listen for three hours. So, <laughs> But we're talking about acts of worship, and we went through clapping and bowing down, just kind of talking about all the different physical acts, and we, we really discovered it's really more about the heart posture than it is the physical posture. This morning we did bow down, yes, but that is illustrating what our spirit inside is saying, is that I will humble myself to your plan and your purpose. That is what the physical act is showing. So we do the physical act to create that so our spirit can take control, right? The more we lay down our physical self and disconnect our mind from it, the more the spirit can take control and lead and guide us, just like we were singing this morning. And that's what all those physical acts are for. And today we're going to talk about one. This is really, uh, this is really different. And I'm going to say something, and you're all going to get an image in your head. Watch. I'm going to say, we're talking about giving. And everybody in here saw the emoji with the dollar signs. Ching, ching, ching. And that's not even what we're talking about. It has absolutely nothing to do with that. While it is an aspect of giving, that's not what we're talking about this morning. We're talking about the altar this morning. It's something that's it's kind, of, kind of lost uh, in our culture. We don't understand sacred spaces. That's what an altar is, a sacred space. I made the joke to somebody. that I said the most sacred space that we have in our culture is the bathroom. And it's kind of sad. But that is the, pretty much the only sacred space. And y'all even bring Facebook into that. So, you know, yeah, all the guys started laughing right there. Uh, so, but we're talking about altars, and, and it's an interesting thing. So we're going to kind of run through this. And the, the main core scripture that we're going to be looking at is, is 1 Kings 18. It's the whole chapter of uh, uh, 1 Kings 18. I'm going to kind of summarize it for you guys there. Uh, but that's going to be our core kind of story that we're looking at to help us illustrate this. And then we're going to look at a few more verses here. So what is an altar? If we were to say, well, what's an altar? An altar is simply an elevated place. And I'm going to read the actual the definition here. It's an elevated place of which worship happens. It's an elevated place of which worship happens. It's an elevated place in which you bring yourself and lower yourself to whatever it is you're worshiping. Now, for us, that should be Christ and God, right? But you can put other things in place of that worship. We, we won't really get into that today. So an altar is an elevated place. We look all throughout scripture and we see usually they end up on high mountains and things of that nature and they build them out of, out of stone, out of rock, and it's an elevated place, a dedicated set-aside space in which worship happens and that then we can lower ourselves and humble ourselves to the will of God. Now, altars are where the spiritual place and physical place merge and combine. We call this the house of God. This is a version in our day and age of, of an altar because this is where we come and we worship. But you can have altars. Matter of fact, in a lot of other cultures and, and beliefs and stuff, uh, they have altars set up in their houses. Y'all ever seen it where they have like the little Buddha and they have the candles or whatever, or they have a picture of, 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 of different saints or maybe they have a picture of a, of, of a dead family member even and they put, that's, that's an altar. It's a version of an altar. Uh, it's not my particular version of an altar. It'd be a little weird in my opinion, you know, but you know, they teach their own, I guess. Uh, so, but if, if this is a place where an exchange happens, this is how I want to say it to you. I want you, if you're writing notes, write it down. If not, go back and listen to the, the video. An altar, when the, the spiritual realm and the physical realm combine, that is the place where God responds actively to altar activity. If there's activity in the altar, if there's worship happening, God will respond actively to that. But 
An altar is just a pile of rocks or is just a place in which you worship or is just a, a way that we worship. What do you put on the altar? We call this a sacrifice. We even sing it. Let this be a sacrifice. Let me dedicate my life to worship. But sacrifice. What is a sacrifice? You can look up lots of different definitions of sacrifice. And I'm going through this pretty quickly, guys, and I'm sorry. I know I get told all the time I talk too fast. Sorry. Listen up because I'm trying to get to the main thing that we need to talk about today. Uh, but what is a sacrifice? This is the best uh, definition that I saw when I, when I was researching kind of in the Webster's Dictionary. It's also throughout Scripture what it is. And it's this. It's to turn over your possessions to somebody else or something else. That is the definition of sacrifice, is to turn over my possessions to someone else or something else. So yesterday, we had a great example of this. Yesterday, and by the way, uh, and, uh, and last weekend, uh, several weekends in a row, we've had several people coming up and assisting and helping build these walls. Not the one Trump's trying to build. Totally different. Uh, but build the walls, and, and I don't know if y'all caught the video of the kids trying to explain the, the, the construction. That was quite humorous. I decided to get them all together because I heard them talking about popcorn and they were eating popcorn, so I thought that's, like, they had a little popcorn, but I thought that's what they were talking about. Nope, they, that was popcorn, and we're making more popcorn to put on the wall. It was hilarious. But all these people came up, and they did something. They sacrificed what? Their possession, their time. They gave their time. And thank you guys, by the way, everybody that came up and helped all these over these weekends and throughout the week uh, and everything like that. We really appreciate it. But they were sacrificing, right? They were taking something that they possessed, their time, and sacrificing it, giving it over control to... Well, primarily God, but because they really got ticked at me when I was, you know, scatterbrained and jumping all over the place, right? Right, Wally? <laughs> but that is what a sacrifice is, is to turn over your possessions of. So when we talk about putting a sacrifice on the altar, it's a possession. Now, again, I say possession. Most of you guys think dollar signs. You think cars. You think houses. Sure, that's a piece of it. But we're looking at something a little deeper here. So... The story of 1 Kings 18. Can I tell you the story? This happens in chapter 18. You really should probably start at like chapter 17 to kind of understand the scope of what all's happening as we get to that. But in chapter 18, this is, this is where we're at. And in chapter 18, basically, your, your scene set here is we've got the prophet. Everybody know the prophet? No one knows the prophet yet? We've talked about this like 15 times. We've got Elijah coming, okay? And he is the prophet. And we've got Ahab as the king. And we've got these worshipers of Baal here. And basically what's happened in, 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 in Israel is Baal worship has now taken over. Like that is the primary form of worship that they do. It would be the equivalent of here if we all of a sudden decided that we were all uh, Buddhists, let's just say. Okay? A different form of worship has taken over. And here's what happens is Elijah comes and says, all right. Well, God kind of speaks to Elijah. You need to read the story. But all right, we're going to end this. This is how I'm putting it. This is Jared Thompson's version. This is the international Jared Thompson version of what happened. Okay? So he says, listen, I'm going to end this. And he goes to Ahab. And this is something I find funny. Ahab says, Elijah, you're old troubler of Israel is the way that the King James Version says. He's like, listen, troublemaker. Yeah, we don't know we ain't going to do this. And I thought that interesting that, that he comes and says, listen, you're the troublemaker. How can one guy cause so much ruckus in an entire nation? Well, I had a little, little thought here because they were, because then Elijah says, no, 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 I'm not the troublemaker. You've brought this trouble. And they're like, what trouble? What are you talking about? Everything was going great for, the children, for, for all of Israel. They were worshiping the wrong things, but they were going, it was all going great for them. But Elijah was causing them to have to check themselves and say, hey, 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 maybe we need to look at this a different way. So basically what happens is they start to talk. And I'm summarizing this because, like I said, uh, you need to read the entire story. But when they get together, he says, listen, get all the prophets of Baal together. And you're going to do your sacrifice. And then I'm going to pray to the God of Israel, God Almighty, and I'll do my sacrifice. And whichever God answers in fire and consumes the sacrifice, that'll be the God of Israel. Deal? Deal. See? Look, they made deals back in the old days too. Handshake agreement. Maybe they had a written contract on some stone tablets. Maybe take them a couple days to chisel that out. I'm not sure. Uh, but they make this agreement. When they make this agreement now, now we have all the prophets of Baal getting together. And here's, again, I'm, I'm summarizing this, but they get together here and they start their worship. And when they start going, and the Bible talks about how they're dancing and they're cutting themselves. I mean, they're doing everything, asking, Baal, why won't you answer? Uh, you know, and then Elijah starts taunting them, which I think is funny. He's like, maybe he's asleep. Maybe, you know, like he, maybe he's deaf. He starts joking around with them about this. So they, they finish up. Nothing happens. 
And Elisha says, okay, now it's my turn. And Elisha does something very, very interesting here, okay? What he does, he says, all right, what we've got to do here before we jump in here. He says, now I'm going to, now it does say Elijah. It doesn't say, and a bunch of other prophets. It just says him. He stood alone in this. And this is where I need a little bit of help, so dad, you can come help me. I'm going to call on him twice. I know lots of stories, too. I've got to think of good stories. Oh, I'll tell you all a good story one time. One time we were in the... <laughs> oh, yeah, did everybody get your rocks, by the way? Yeah. Uh, Wally said Jared, Jared lost, lost his rocks or something like that. <laughs> so so what, what, what Elijah did... Now, I'm using help uh, for because otherwise I can't actually do it all at the same time. But what Elijah did is said, wait, before I start the worship... You can come up here, Dad. <laughs> well, he said, before I start the worship, I've got to do something. This place that we used to offer sacrifices to God, it's in decay. If you look at Genesis 3, this is where the state of man spiritually becomes decayed. The altar becomes decayed in Genesis 3, because then that is what we consider the fall of man. He says, before I offer sacrifice, I've got to do something. I've got to rebuild this altar. So what he does is he starts to rebuild the altar. What I need you to do is help me stack this up against the... And I'm making all those noises, not just for acting purposes, but my back actually really hurts. You look like we're destroying it. Well, maybe you destroy some of your life before you rebuild it. Uh, so <laughs> he starts to rebuild the altar, and he puts these things together, and he starts to get it rebuilt. Now I'm going to need you again in a minute. So you can go sit down now. <laughs> so he starts to rebuild the altar and gets it kind of set up. And then he starts to do something else. There's stones. Now, we're not going to go into significance, but there were 12 stones. that represents the 12 tribes of Israel. Again, read scripture and tune into all the videos throughout the week because I'll explain all the, this detail here. But he starts to get the stones, and he picks them up, and he puts them down. And he begins to rebuild every aspect of what the altar was and puts it back the way it was intended to be. Now, I want you to recall a scripture. Yes, these are made out of chicken wire. They're actually quite light. Uh, <laughs> all that grunting is just, you know, my, my old man back, I guess. But as he starts to pick up the, all, the, the, the rocks, and the rocks would, give or take, probably be about this size. Have anyone ever tried to pick up a bag of concrete, 80-pound bag of concrete? I almost made these out of an 80-pound bag of concrete, except I'm weak. So I would have been quite embarrassed when I had to call my dad up here or somebody to actually move these things. But it would have been work. It would have been difficult, 12 stones. And it says these things were decayed for years and years. So who knows, those stones could have been, I have them quite close, they could have been strung out all over the mountainside. You know, kids like to play with rocks. You know, I don't know, maybe Samson was up there, you know, and threw them somewhere sometime. He had to go chase them down, I don't know. He had to go get the rocks and he put his hands. Now we talked about a scripture that talks about commit thy works to God. And then your thoughts will be established. Before he said, okay, okay, God, now do your thing. He said, no, I'm going to put my hands to it. I'm going to put my work to it, and I'm going to rebuild it. Now, I don't know if these will actually stay stuck the way I want them to. And he picks up all the stones, and he puts them on the altar. And he rebuilds it exactly how it needed to be. He puts the stones back and gets it right in order. Then... A couple other things happen. Then he, say, he gets his sacrifice ready. He says, go get water. Now, they were in a drought at the time. Okay? We talk about droughts in our area, you know, and not like this. There was a drought at the time, and he says, pour water on it. And then they do it, and he says, no, go get some more water on it, pour water. Now, this is interesting because it was a drought. Water would have been precious. And he poured it on the, on the altar. Okay? And he poured it on here, and then he begins to pray. Now, interesting, he didn't pray. For 40 days and 40 nights, he didn't do, have to go cut his wrist. He didn't have to do any of that. He just prayed and God consumed the sacrifice. Now, I'm telling you this story because you, you need to go read it and see some of the, some of the similarities here. But there's a couple of things we want to look at. It's first the rebuilding of the altar. How do we rebuild the altar in our own lives? It's in a state of decay. Whether it is you, you're, you're a brand new believer or you're an unbeliever or you've been a believer your whole life, there's a state of decay at some rate. Whether it's from from just being in life. And you know, see, that's the interesting thing. And again, I don't want to get on this because I'm going to give it away for Easter because what we're talking about is going to be all the way till Easter, guys. It's going to be crazy. But in Genesis, we see a place that man has created that is called Eden. And he's put there, and that was the original communication. See, remember, this is the place. The altar is the place in which 
interaction between the spiritual and the natural happens. Okay? That was what happened on a daily basis for Adam and Eve. It says they walked and talked with God in the cool of the day. They had direct communication. Okay? We're not going to be there. But when that happened in, verse, in, in chapter 3, when they, when they lost that communication now, now there was these other ways. There was these physical altars they had to build and physically sacrifice all these things to get there. We lost that communication. So whether you're in that state of decay of just simply you need to know God or whether you've known who's, who, is, who is saved in this place. And if, and, and, and if you don't feel comfortable, raise your hand. You don't have to. But if you're saved, yes. Okay? I would venture to say probably I know, personally know, Every person in here, actually. Great. So you are. Great. How many of us have been saved for six months? A year? Some of us, 40 years. I had an interesting conversation this week and said, well, when were you saved? I was like, I don't really remember. At some point in my life, I don't know really why I could tell you when it took, because I was always around this. But there's still a state of decay. This is, this is why, honestly... Uh, and, and I'm sorry, but this morning when I started praying, I've never had that happen to me before. There's a lot of things that never been happened to me before. Yeah, you know, brain tumor, one of them, you yeah. <laughs> know. Hopefully that never happens again. You know, but <laughs> up here, I, I just started crying. That's what I was thinking. I was thinking about this statement, the state of decay. Is God removed the state of decay? Let me rebuild the altar. Let me rebuild my life in a manner that it's an elevated thing that I can humble my life to you. Rebuild the altar. Now, there's, there's two things here that happens. Elijah committed his works to God. Again, refer back to those other sessions because that'll give you a whole other meaning. He said, no, I'm going to take my work, my hands. There's scripture after scripture talks about whatever you put your hands to will prosper. Again, prosper is not just money. Yes, that is a piece of it. Yes, that is what we use to live in our daily lives. But prosper means to succeed whatever I put my hands to. So if you're looking and saying chaos is succeeding in my life, what are you putting your hands to? If you say that peace is succeeding in my life, look what you're putting your hands to. And Elijah said, listen, they probably were making fun of him. He could have just done the sacrifice without rebuilding the altar. Stones don't burn, guys. So he could have done it anywhere. But he said, no, no, no. I'm going to take the time and I'm going to put my works. I'm going to put my hands to it because I want this sacrifice to prosper. And it did in the story. If you look, the whole nation of Israel turns back to God because he put his hands to it and he made it prosper. Now, in our lives, you say, oh, that's all well and good, Jared. That was thousands of years ago. I'm not going to go build. And if you feel, we call this a barbecue pit now, by the way, guys. That's what we call it, okay? And if you want to start sacrificing on your barbecue pit, that's fine. Just invite me over. I like steak, okay? But how does this apply spiritually? Because that's what this is all about. Remember, all we've talked about is how the physical action is to illustrate to ourselves and to put our flesh down and to allow our spirit to rise. I believe this. Every time you bow down, what you're really doing is laying down the physical self and saying, I want more spirit, more spirit, and then spirit rise up. Spirit rise up every time. So how does this apply? How does the altar apply? We need to look at what is an altar in our lives and what is the sacrifice in our lives. And it's simply this. The altar is your work. Now, I say work. Some of you thought of where you work. Absolutely. That can be a part of it. But it's what you put your hands to. There's scriptures that talk about do everything as unto the Lord. There can become a place and an act of worship that is quite literally the steps that you take. Every step of a righteous man are ordered of the Lord. I'm quoting scripture here for you. I'm not giving you the addresses because you have to watch the videos. That's how I get more Facebook views. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> But you have to, you have to put, put your steps. And it can literally come to a place that the very act of breathing is the act of worship. If the heart motive be right. So the altar is your work. The altar is the things that you do. How do you do them? That's the altar. But what's the sacrifice? Justin, where'd you put my things? Ooh. Hey, Dad. Vanna White, yes. What are, the, what are the things? Okay, you can hold all those. You can step up here because the camera can't see you either, Dad. <laughs> Isn't this so much fun? Oh, wait, I need to bend you to my will like you used to. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> so we have the altar. What is the altar? I just said it, guys. Come on. Work. work. It's your works, right? That's the altar. But what do you place on the altar? I hope you're listening to this. The altar is your works, but what you place on the altar is your life. What is your life? We talked about this in one of our other sessions. It's your resources. What are your resources? Pride could be one of your resources. You could ask for pride to be replaced with humility. Worry. You could ask for worry to be replaced with peace. 
These are your resources that scripture tells us. And that's what the whole acts of worship is to do is to say, I'm taking these things that are my resources. I put my work to it. And now my life on a daily basis, I want to sacrifice it and give over. What does sacrifice mean? To turn over the possessions. I turn over the possession of my pride to you. That's a little bit of an easier one sometimes. We work at that a lot. But, you know, some people say, well, I'm not very prideful. That's okay, cool. How about your worry? If there's anybody in here that says they don't worry, you're either Bob Marley or you need to be up here talking. Okay? Worries. Turn it over and, and rest. There's a whole scripture about rest here. Turn over your worries. Oh, what about, let's, let's do some, some uh, different ones. I want to do, no, no, I'm picking. How about this one? This is a hard one sometimes. How about Hurts. Turn over your hurts. I heard an amazing song. I'm going to plug this group, Jonathan, wherever you're at. Thank you for this song. It's by a group called I Am They, and it's called Scars. And the whole song talks about I'm thankful for the scars. The first time it talks about those about my scars and the things that I've went through in life because it shows me who you are. The next one talks about the scars of Christ. But turn over your hurts. In your life, sometimes we go through life and doing our works, but we're doing them from a place of hurt. And when we do them from a place of hurt, now it gets distorted. And it, it can't be a, a true act of worship. That is what some in Scripture would call false worship, maybe. And again, I'm not saying that, oh, you're false worship, you're going to hell. It has nothing to do with that. It has to do with, if you have hurts in your heart, Christ, God says, turn them over to me, and I'll replace the hurts with victory. Amen. Now we have something else here. Let, let's do this one. We're going to do this one next. Oh, wait, no, no, we're going to do this one next. <laughs> I'm just keeping them up here as long as I can. Money. Here's giving. Okay. This is the one. I should have put an emoji with the dollar signs on there. But, Justin, could you have drawn that for me? Uh, but money. This is one, right? We use all of our time to achieve money. So that is something. Yes, absolutely. We're going to talk about that more later, but that's not the core of this. But this is a hard one to give, right? Especially when, you know, we are. Some of us live paycheck to paycheck and sometimes have no paycheck to no paycheck. You know, it just depends. Money is something that we have to sacrifice and turn over the possession of. This one is a little bit easier to understand because it's something physical. And we say, oop, I dropped it in the offering plate. Cool. I did my sacrifice. No, no, no. It's the heart motive behind it. These are a little bit harder sometimes to understand because we say, oh yeah, 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 I'm not prideful. I'm not really, I don't really worry because God's got me, what have you like that. You know, let something really bad happen. We'll see how much you don't worry sometimes. You know, I've had some of these things happen in my life just recently and guess what? You know, I thought, yeah, I'm faith. I believe in faith and God. And it's like, whoa, do I? I don't know. I had to check myself. And again, I'm not condemning you. Just This is where we self-evaluate and we come to the altar and we say, God, what is it that I have that I need to sacrifice? Our hurts, our money. Is that two? Is this one? How about family? You say, how do I sacrifice my family? Not like Isaac, you know, none of that. I mean, sometimes you may want to do that to your children, but that is not the intent behind this. <laughs> but family, some of you are holding on to your family and you just turn it over to God and say, God, I give it to you. I want you to take control of my family, whether that is you're the, 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 the husband in the house and it's a spouse relationship and your kids are grown or your kids are still with you, whether it is you're a father and you're trying to train up your child and they ain't going in a way that you think they should. Whatever it is, but turn the family over. Some of you got distant family members that you've been praying for and praying for and maybe beating them over the head with the Bible. And God says, hey, if you just shut your mouth and show love, I'll take care of it. But you got to come to the altar because our works determine how we sacrifice. And how about this one? And then I'm going to need you back up here in just a moment. <laughs> Y'all do aware. I could have just set these down here, but, you know, I just. I'm making sure he gets a little exercise today. And now he has the red beat face that I used to have every time I went down. <laughs> And our time. How about this one? Time. I told my children this the other day. Uh, I'm going to tell this story. And I'm not, uh, if this gets all over Facebook and stuff, Whataburger, I'm sorry. <laughs> Last night we were up here from, I don't know, like 9 till it was about, I don't know, 9 o'clock at night. And we were wrapping up. And I said, honey, we've got to get some food. You know, I'm hungry. So I went to Waterburger and ordered my food. I'm going to shorten this story here. But I went to Waterburger, got my food. I ordered very simple. All, all of our family kind of similar eats alike. So I went and got the food and brought it back. We all drink Sprite. Five drinks Sprite. It's not hard. Two larges, three kids, right? It's not a hard order at all. Long and short of it is they got it wrong. And I'm not one to gripe too much if it's, I gripe, but I would never like say anything because I don't want to spit in my food or anything. But you know, it's like, hey, whatever. They got a few things wrong. But this wasn't a few things, guys. 
Literally, I think the only person that had his order right was Jade, and his order was the same as Ann and Levi's. I don't know, it just baffled me. And I, you know, Whataburger's like going out to Olive Garden these days. It ain't cheap. I was like, all right, I'm going to call because I don't do cheese, guys. And they put, Whataburger, does a number one come with cheese? No, you have to ask for cheese. <laughs> I didn't ask for cheese. They put cheese on it. So I was like, all right, honey, I'm, I got to call him. So I call him and talk to him. I'm like, listen, this is just, you know, can I get, I'm right down the road. Can I? I wanted to say other choice things, but I didn't. I was like, I'll come back. I just want, you know, I just want no cheese on my burger. I just want da 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 And I'm thirsty. I want a big Sprite, you know. Cool, cool, cool. We'll get it. And I forgot, forgot my lemon pie. Brother Jim got me turned on to lemon pies. And I love them from there now. And they forgot my lemon pie. So I go up there, and they do the whole thing. And she's like, sorry. I'm like, hey, no problem. You know, put it in my bag. And I drive back here. And you know what? It still ain't right. Still didn't get my lemon pie. Still, <laughs> none of it. So I was like, oh, my gosh, I'm about to lose my salvation. And, you know, and that, uh, I drive to that Whataburger all the time. They see me every Sunday morning. So I, I'm, I'm trying to think in my head. I'm like, okay, I can't be too, too Jared. <laughs> so I call him back. I'm like, listen, this is ridiculous, guys. I mean, you got it wrong twice. It's not that hard. I, I, you know, blah, 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 blah. And I said, listen, I just want you to refund me for the stuff I didn't get and you didn't get right. Well, I can't do half of it. I can only do all of it because you paid on a car. I said, well, that's your problem. I'm refund me everything. And Levi and Jade, i tell you all that story so you understand the scope, because my kids came up here. And uh, they said, did they get it right or something? And I said, no. And they said, well, what'd they do? I said, they gave us all of our money back. They said, and Levi said, just for the part that, that they got wrong? I said, no, that's what I originally wanted because I didn't really care that much. You know, but no, they gave it all back because that spent my time, effort, and energy and stuff. I said, and the most important resource that you have, I teach my kids, is your time. Because that's what you are aware when you go to work. They are buying your time. They own you for that time. So, by the way, when we're talking about fasting coming up and you're at work, that doesn't mean you get paid to pray. You get paid to work. So do your work. Okay? So, but anyway, it's a little side topic there. It's just a side jab for you. But time, it's your most important resource. Because all that time that I spent going back and forth to Whataburger, my kids and all them that had their food right, they all ate. And now I missed out on an opportunity to dine on the platform. It was such a nice dining experience, by the way. Uh, but your time is an important resource. These are the things that we sacrifice on the altar. The altar is our work, our daily lives, what we do. These things right here that is what we put on the altar. Now, here comes the big, the big reveal, guys. Are you ready? We'll just put all these over here. Oh. Hey, Dad, i got a question for you. Do you want to be the offerer or the offering? So, <laughs> so let's, let's look at this real quick. Does this make sense to anybody? I hope it's helping you. I hope it's showing you the acts of worship that we do. Let's bring something into light, and I think it's so funny. I just had a conversation right before service, actually, that is, is, is kind of in line with this here. We look at Scripture in mo virtually two parts, Old Testament, New Testament. We largely break that from the sense of Christ, because we believe he is the Messiah. Now, Christ is considered to be what? The lamb that was slain from the foundations of the world, some of it says, in, in certain verses. He is the sacrifice to atone for all sacrifices. There's a scripture that tells us this is right here. And that is in 1 John 2.2. 2. Sorry, Jonathan, I gave them to you in reverse. But 1 John 2.2 2. It says Christ was sent to atone. He's the final sacrifice. He was sent to atone for all this. Okay? Um, yeah, right here. So it's appropriate for all of our sins and for the whole world. All of them. So instead of back in the old days, they had to do every year, they had to do like a lamb and a goat or whatever like that, and they had to atone for all of their sins. But, he, but Christ came and said, now I'm the final one. You don't have to do any of that anymore. Okay? So what do we see here? We see the sacrificial thing change from the physical now to the spiritual. Now it's not the physical thing that you do that creates the sacrifice. Now it's the spiritual thing that you do. Because here's what Christ did at the end of the day. I don't even need my notes for the rest of this. John 15, 13 is the next one. Jonathan, you can go ahead and put it up there if you want to. Uh, here's the last piece of it. When Christ came, he came to show us the way. He came and showed us love. And John 15, 13 says, No greater love has any man than to lay down his life for his friends.
Christ showed us that in the ultimate sacrifice. That's what we call it, the ultimate sacrifice or the final sacrifice. He came, laid his life down so we would know the way and how to live. We would know what to put as a sacrifice. And here's what happened. And I hope in my mind this is going to be great because I feel like God gave it to me. And if it doesn't make sense to you, I'm sorry. But just follow along with me here. This is where I need you, Dad. This time, which one did you decide? Okay, I, do you want to be Jesus? You always made me the, the devil one. I'll be Jesus because that way you don't have to lay on the table. But... <laughs> So here's what he says. He says, he's the sacrifice, okay? You're following along, right? He's the sacrifice. He put his works together to make an altar. And we see that throughout Scripture in the Gospels. And then he made his sacrifice. And he said, all right, I'm going to see if I can lay on this table. I'm a little heavier than I used to be. He lays down and says, now he was on a cross, right? But he's on the altar. All of the works that he did, and he says, now I sacrifice myself. This is quite comfortable. I should teach from this position. He says, I sacrifice myself in place. And this is what happened right here. He laid down his life for us to show us the way. And here's what it is. Now, we've read all these scriptures. Can you hold all these for me? This is you. Some of you, you look more handsome than you used to. Some of you, you aged a little bit. This is you. Imagine I'm Jesus. Okay? I could put on a robe for you if you wanted to. But imagine I'm Jesus. We see scripture after scripture that says, bring it all and lay it before his feet. We just sang it. I lay my life before your feet. Because this is what happens. Jesus came, and he says, now give it all to me. Now let me show you what to do with this. And he came and said, not only do I place, and throw them down, sorry, all of the things on the altar. But you know what? There's just even a better way than all those things. Just take your whole self, physical, spirit, soul, and body, and just put it all down on there. Instead of just the things, put everything down before on the altar. Put all your works, put all yourself, because that's what I did. That's what you should do, because I'm showing you the way to worship. I'm showing you the acts. Yes, we still do the physical acts. Why? The physical acts are because we're stubborn. But he said, hey, listen, this is how you do it. That's what you do. And he says, let me, let me show you. Put your things down, and then I put, my place, I put myself in place of you. Now all you got to do is give me yourself. Amen. You don't have to go and sacrifice. Wouldn't it be wouldn't, isn't it great that, that we don't have to be like, Dad, it's time to atone for our sins. I better go get me a cow because I need more than just the blood of a, of a little lamb because I got some, got some big ones. So we go and we, we, we slaughter this whole thing. We just, you know, that'd be quite messy. I've never personally done it, but I can imagine, you know, you get a little bit of a cut and see the blood. We don't have to do any of that anymore. He says, let me show you. I'm going to show you how to lay your life down right here. Just like I did, now you do. That's why we come and we call these places, we call these sacred spaces and stuff altars, is because it's a place that we can remember something that happened. Just like this morning, some people got a, 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 an encounter with God and they can remember it. And that's why it says to walk with Christ. It's a daily walk because we learn every day how to lay more and more of ourselves down. Because if you could learn how to lay your whole self down in an instant, you wouldn't have to be here anymore. You'd be there. But we have to learn how to lay ourselves down. So he says, hey, walk with me. And he's showing us how to take the steps to get to where we need to be. But it's all through access. Jesus says, hey, guess what? I healed the sick. You do that. <laughs> then he said, hey, guess what? I went and I humbled myself to my father. Now you humble yourself. He says, listen, can you bow down with me? Is your back not hurt too much? <laughs> so he says, hey, I bow down. You bow down. Hey, I stand up, you stand up. Hey, I clap, you clap. He says, hey, I lifted my hands to the Father, you lift your hands to the Father, and he's showing us the way. Amen. Does everybody get that? Yes. Thank yes. you, self. <laughs> that is what the purpose of the altar was. That is the purpose of giving. It's what Christ came to do. He gave, and he's showing us how to give. We raised just money. If you just put money in the offering plate and think that is your giving, you have marginalized the biggest act in, the, in history. And you have marginalized it for yourself. I'm going to do a, a series soon called The Giving Game. 
I thought of this when I was studying this because that's what we've, we've created. It's the giving game. Hey, you give, and then I give to you. You give, and I give to you. And yes, that happens. God does bless you for giving. But hey, guess what? We see scripture after scripture. Jesus is sitting there, which this is also weird, by the way. <laughs> He's sitting there, and they're watching people put money in the offering plate. Imagine that this morning. We stand up here when we take up the offering. We just stand and watch you. Hey, hey, how much did you, Dad? Come on, I know you're leaving, but come on. Like, I don't say that they did that, but they watched. And this little old lady comes in and gives two mites. Let's just say one cent. It's actually less than that. Uh, but she gives two mites, and he says, she's giving greater than anyone else. Why? It was the heart posture like we've been talking about. She built an altar and said, all my works and all I got is these two mites, but I lay it all in myself down here because Amen. that's what giving truly is. That's what sacrifice is, is to give of my possessions. And your possessions are far beyond the things of this world. Your true possessions, or your treasure is laid up in heaven, right? We see scriptures that talk about this. And this all comes from creating a proper posture within our hearts to understand and walk how Jesus showed us to walk and understand. Amen. Everybody got your rocks, right? Get your rock and hold it in your hand. We're not turning to rock worship, okay? Anything of that nature. I like to do things like this periodically to remember something by. I want you to take this rock. We're going we're gonna to get ready to receive. Uh, we're going to pray, actually, get ready to receive our, our, our portion of our giving this morning. And I want you to take that rock and look at that rock. And it's just a rock. If you don't have a rock, well, Scotty Bob will give you a rock. But you take that rock. That's what the altar was built out of, was rocks, the works. And all of this right here on top is your life. The altar is your life. See, that's the thing Christ showed us, was the altar is the body, is yourself, and the sacrifice is your life. What is your life? It's your resources. It's your daily activity. So as we make sure everybody has these, these rocks here, some of yours may be all different colors, it's fine. I challenge you to take this rock and put it in a place. It is not, I don't want you to worship the rock. I'm not saying pray in front of the rock. I'm not saying kneel in front of the rock. Is everybody aware of me, America? Keep it in balance here, okay? This is just a rock. Matter of fact, I was going to go buy them, and we found some sitting here. God knows how long they've been here. I don't even know what they were used for. We didn't wash them either, by the way. Uh, so, <laughs> everybody keeping that in balance. But I want you to use this just as an altar in ancient times was the specific place that they went to. I want you to take this and put it somewhere that you do not lose it. I don't care if it's taped to your dashboard because you spend more time in front of your dashboard than you do anywhere else. I don't care if it's in the mirror because you like to look at yourself and fix your hair. See, I just shaved mine off so you don't have to worry about it. So I don't care where it is, but put it somewhere that reminds you daily to put your works and commit them unto the Lord because that is what will draw all men unto him. That is, our, uh, that is the end result of what we're supposed to do. So I want you to take this rock. It's just simply a rock. But it's to remind you. It's a reminder. It's a memorial to say, I commit my works today. I challenge you to do that every day. If it's in the morning time when you wake up and it's sitting beside the sink, hey, put it beside your toothbrush. Everybody does brush their teeth in the morning, right? Put it beside your toothbrush. Tape it to your toothbrush. Tape it to your pen. Tape it to the back of your iPhone. Go for it. You know, just don't drop it in water. It will sink then. Put it somewhere where you remember. And every day, from this week to the next week, and you can continue on as long as you want, let it be a reminder of this morning, whether it was in the worship time you had experience or you were about to. Let it be a reminder of this right here. Commit your works and lay your life. Just as Christ did, that's what he came to show us. To God the Father.